So, uh, accepting hallucinatory perception is accepting the view that all visual hallucinations constitutively involve visual perception. So here I'm going to be using perception as a success term and I'm going to omit visual for the remainder of the talk. Because contemporary views uh, reject hallucinatory perception, they deny that perception can be fundamental to all visual experience. So nothing like a common factor naive realist view uh, could be the case. Instead we have views like representationalism or disjunctivism which deny that perception is fundamental to all perceptual experiences. Um, so what I'm going to argue is that uh, given that rejecting hallucinatory perception is a significant conclusion to draw given its role in uh, the way we uh, understand theories of perceptual experience, we need, we need a good reason to reject uh, hallucinatory perception. I'm going to argue that one central reason for denying the constitutive role of perception in hallucinations focusing on the existence of these cases, which I'm going to call hard hallucinations, uh, fails to motivate a non-perceptual view of hallucinations. Okay, so um, philosophers typically define hallucinations as not involving perception. There's a few handouts, uh, there's a few quotes on your handout, but let me just read one of them. So this is from Smith, uh, from A.D. Smith, uh, 2002. Uh, he says, in illusion, although a physical object appears other than it actually is, that very object is really perceived. In hallucination, that physical object does not exist. If you're misperceiving a part of the carpet as a pink crack, you have a case of illusion, not a case of hallucination. So, one reason for philosophers to kind of stick with this definition is that we typically distinguish between different cases of hallucinations, and it's widely agreed that some cases uh, seem possible without perception. Now, these cases are variously described in the literature. Sometimes they're called perfect hallucinations, or total hallucinations, or pure hallucinations. And I think these are supposed to be roughly alike, but they're defined differently, and so they have different extensions. So let me just talk about these different types of hallucinations. So pure hallucinations are described by Fish, and he argues that unlike impure cases, pure hallucinations take place in the absence of an, any background experience of the world, and will therefore not have an acquaintance-based phenomenal character. Um, by contrast, total hallucinations, described by Genone, uh, he says, uh, they involve the hallucination of an entire scene such that the subject's experience bears no relation to her actual environment. And then finally you have perfect or sometimes causally matching hallucinations uh, and so here Soteri writes uh, it's theoretically possible by activating some brain processes involved when a, subjectively, uh, when a subject genuinely perceives the world to cause a hallucination subjectively indistinguishable from that perception. So given that these cases are formulated differently and so have somewhat different extensions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, posit this uh, new category of hallucinations. I'm going to call these hard hallucinations. And they're supposed to have features of all of these above uh, uh, types. Um, so hard hallucinations are going to be cases that involve no perceptually relevant relation to the surroundings. So unlike pure cases, they're not constrained uh, to contributions to phenomenal character. Um, second, they're going to possess a perceptual character, but not necessarily a subjectively indistinguishable character. And so they're going to be a bit perfect, different from perfect hallucinations. And this is because I want to include cases of hallucination that might not be uh, subjectively indistinguishable from perceptions. And then finally, I'm going to say that uh, hard hallucinations do not involve perception in any sense modality whatsoever. I'm going to say this explicitly, unlike uh, the total cases. And this is because I'm trying to exclude those cases where you might have no relation in one uh, sense modality, but relations in other sense modalities. And this will allow us to exclude cases where the hallucination might involve uh, cross-modal interactions. You might uh, receive inputs from one sense, but process them in another. Okay. So now that we have hard hallucinations, uh, we've defined hard hallucinations, uh, let's turn to an argument for uh, maintaining uh, hallucinatory perception. So here I'm going to look at Wadzel's smooth transition uh, argument. So Sebastian Wadzel uh, defends this uh, or, or articulates this argument in his dissertation. Uh, and here's what he says uh, by way of defending the claim that all uh, perceptual experiences involve uh, uh, actually attending to uh, particulars in our surroundings. He says, Contemporary philosophers often consider the bad case in isolation from the good case. There's a tomato present in the good case, while there's no tomato present in the bad case. But this is a mistake. 
Um, there's a smooth transition from the good case to the bad cases. That is, a continuum of intermediary cases that lead from the good case to every bad case. One would have to find some point in that transition uh, where our perceptual attention ceases to have an object and where we thus step from attending to something to merely seeming to attend to something. So the idea is that there's no easy uh, place to draw the line where we move from attending to seeming to attend. And uh, Watson, in fact, looks at a series of cases to establish this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take his cases and divide them into four broad types. So the four types are, there's cases of type one where uh, they are cases like, for instance, perceiving a tomato. Then type two cases involve perceiving objects that are qualitatively identical to a tomato, ranging from ordinary solid objects like a wax tomato to exotic objects like light projections displayed in a particular way to look as if they were a tomato. Um, and then there's type three cases, which are cases of perceiving diffuse objects. So although you have parts located in different places, these appear as a single tomato with the help of lenses, prisms, and other light dispersing or dis distorting objects. And then finally, there's type 4 cases, which are cases of perceiving uh, progressively closer stimuli, first closer to the retina, then direct stimulations of the retina, and finally penetrating the body of the perceiver uh, or the hallucinator and becoming uh, direct stimulations of some of their inner parts. Um, okay, so. Watzel doesn't directly focus on hard hallucinations, he's more interested in looking at the continuity between uh, hallucinations, illusions, and perceptions, but he clearly intends his smooth transition to apply to hard hallucinations because he doesn't exclude any cases from the smooth transition. Uh, and plausibly, uh, these hard cases will, many of them will at least occur in uh, cases of type 4. Uh, but these cases, you know, in Watzel's picture, involve an appeal to internal objects since you, you get these cases where you've penetrated uh, the perceiver or the hallucinator's body and you become in, in direct stimulations of inner parts. Um, and now Watzel accepts this appeal to internal objects because he denies what he calls the externality principle. He says, the smooth transition argument shows that there's no clear line between what is external to a subject's body and what is inside her body. It seems completely arbitrary to say that whether there is something you attend to depends on whether photons are, say, randomly created inside or outside this gelatinous body. And by straightforward generalization, the same holds to, uh, seems to hold true of all other lines one might draw. Now, whether one uh, accepts the rejection of the externality principle or not, the problem with appealing to internal objects is that there's some prima facie problems uh, with them if you're trying to preserve a view on which you're, uh, 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 you have access to the external world. So first of all, if you perceive internal objects, these internal objects might uh, threaten to occlude the external world outside of us, so they could function as occluders. Second of all, they could uh, perceptually mediate our relationship to our surroundings in the same way that sense data are supposed to. Finally, they might explanatorily screen off the role of external objects by sufficiently explaining the phenomenology of perceptual experience. So, because of these problems, uh, it seems that the appeal to internal objects is, uh, it needs to be kind of qualified in various ways. But before I do this, I want to note that it's not the case that all hard hallucinations involve appealing to problematic internal objects. First, some cases don't involve appeal to any internal objects whatsoever. Some of them just involve unusual external objects. Cases like those are cases are, are pro probably cases like the Matrix, or cases like an invaded uh, brain, or uh, the evil demon case. In all of those cases, it's the surroundings that are extraordinary in a particular way, and the perceiver might just see those external surroundings, but those surroundings are, uh, you know, uh, hallucinatory uh, because of their uh, nature or because of the way the situation is constructed. Um, there's also proximate objects, objects like, you know, direct stimulations of the retina, those won't count as internal objects. And then there's also superficially internal objects, like if I have the direct stimulator uh, and it some, somehow now penetrates the eye, uh, that doesn't make it a problematic internal object because it's unlikely to occlude perceptually mediate or explanatorily screen off external objects except in those cases where there in fact is this direct stimulation. So because these cases don't exist all the time uh, they're not likely to cause problems all the time. Uh, okay, so which cases are the difficult cases? Well the difficult cases are cases like what uh, David Chalmers uh, and Thomas Raleigh uh, following Chalmers describe as the chaos case. So here's Raleigh describing uh, this chaos case he says, 
Presumably, it's in some sense possible that the photoreceptors in the eye might begin to fire even though there has been, they have received no readily identifiable prior stimulus. And such random firings precisely match the pattern of firings that would occur were the subject to see, for example, a lemon. But in such a hypothetical case, there would be no equivalent of the machine or demon to be a candidate object of visual awareness. So roughly the idea is that uh, you might just have a brain uh, emerge in outer space and it might enter into the state that my brain is in right now and this would presumably give it the same sort of experience. Okay, so uh, to respond to these cases, um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us a way of better evaluating the ad adequacy of proposing internal objects and I'm going to do this by turning to hard cases themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the possibility of, or the, 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 situ the scenario of a hypothetical creature. Uh, this is a creature that's exactly like us, you can see it on the last page of your handout, and it's supposed to be a purely visual creature, so although it's like us, it's only a purely visual creature. And this will allow me to make a unimodal case where we can kind of consider the hallucinations that occur in those cases. So let's call this creature ocular, and we can now describe ocular situation in four uh, different scenarios. Uh, so the first scenario, is that its eyes are shut, so ocular's eyes are closed, and when its eyes are closed, uh, no light whatsoever enters, so you can imagine that it has slightly thicker eyelids than ours. Uh, second of all, um, there's another scenario where ocular is fa finds itself in a perfectly dark room where no light enters this room. Uh, third of all, this, there's a scenario where ocular is blind because its visual system has received some damage and as a result it sees nothing. And then finally there's surgery where ocular's visual system is surgically removed. Now plausibly, <clears throat> if ocular hallucinates in any of these four scenarios, its hallucination is going to count as a hard hallucination since there's nothing in its surroundings for it to be perceiving, at least on the face of it. Uh, now what I'm going to argue is that contrary to appearances, right, the first two cases in fact do involve perception. Uh, the last case does not involve perception, but it does also does not involve hallucinations, and the third case is underdetermined. So let's look at the first two cases. I mean, the, the first two cases involve perception, uh, and this is because we can intuitively make a distinction between two things. Uh, this is the absence of perception and the perception of absence. So, in the absence of perception, you lack a particular sense modality. So, for instance, I lack echolocation, and so I have an absence of perception with respect to echolocation in that case. By con contrast, the perception of absence is uh, the it, it doesn't make you, uh, or uh, the perception of absence leaves you a being with a particular sense modality. It's just that your sense modality in that case is going to be idling in some way because the situation is not conducive to that uh, sense modality's uh, kind of uh, uh, stable or regular operation. Um, okay, so then we have the difference between being a sighted being versus being a being that uh, cannot see at all, right? And we can also talk about a being which has sight but which is not currently seeing. Um, okay, so now, uh, is there really this perception of absence? We might think that there isn't this perception of absence. So first of all, the perception of absence, so perceiving a sort of null stimulus, is an old view. Locke discusses this in an essay concerning human understanding. He writes that the idea of black is no longer po uh, no less positive in one's mind than that of white. However, the cause of that color in the external object may only be a privation. And more recently, Sorensen and Phillips have both argued for perceiving null stimuli of various sorts, including things like silence. But there's also some reasons to think that the perception of absence uh, is something that we should preserve. First of all, the distinction is intuitive. There's a difference between my relationship to echolocation versus my relationship uh, to seeing, you know, in a case where I'm in a perfectly dark room. Uh, second of all, um, a, uh, the perception of absence shares uh, various features with perception. Uh, first, a, it informs us about our surroundings. So if I'm in a dark room, I'm informed about my surroundings. I can tell that they're completely dark. Uh, I'm also sensitive to changes in them. I can tell that uh, maybe not everything is equally dark or I can notice some emerging light uh, that starts to show up. Uh, I can also visually attend to different parts of my surroundings. I can see there's darkness here and there's darkness there and I could also notice some differences uh, when uh, moving my uh, gaze from here to there. It might be that there was a light that was uh, in my periphery but now I can see it more clearly. So it seems to me that we're informed about our surroundings, we're sensitive to changes 
vision in them and we can uh, visually attend to different parts even in cases where we perceive absences. Finally, the perception of absences is also similar to another case, which is the case of perceiving uh, positive Gans fields. So imagine that you're placed in a room where everything is painted uniformly white, and now uh, they're painted uniformly white such that you can't tell the difference between any one part of the room and the other. Still, nevertheless, it seems to me that you're seeing the room. You're informed about various features of it, you are sensitive to changes in it, you can att visually attend to different parts. So the difference between a positive and a, uh, a positive Gans field case and a uh, case of perceiving absence is just that the Gans field there is a null stimulus. Now you might wonder, how does the perception of absence help us with understanding internal objects? Well, it helps us because it allows us to locate uh, the role that internal objects can play uh, in various cases. So uh, start by considering your own experiences, your own dark experiences or your own uh, perceptions of absence. So imagine that you're in a perfectly dark room. Now, although what you might be experiencing is perfectly uniformly dark, your experience of it is not uniformly dark. And this is because uh, there's uh, these phosphenes, you know, that you see kind of strewn across your perceptual field and they kind of move, make shapes, uh, change color, they can even change, uh, you can even impact them, you know, by kind of put, putting pressure on your eye or looking at straight light uh, or uh, any number of things. Um, but the point is that these objects are there, so these phosphenes are internal objects and they're objects that I think we can appeal to for cases of hallucination. We can appeal to them uh, because they function well with the perception of absence. First of all, these phosphenes are fleeting and ephemeral, and so this kind of helps explain why hallucinations uh, seem so, real life hallucinations seem so unstable by comparison to perceptions. Um, second of all, they're readily, phosphenes are readily available, they're features of our perceptual system, and more importantly, they're features that are always there. We sometimes notice them, we don't always notice them, and now it's important that we don't always notice them because although they're always uh, present, they're not always perceptually salient. And they're usually perceptually salient in cases that are like Gans field cases because um, in the, uh, when you perceive the ordinary world, a lot of things are competing for your attention and so it's hard to uh, pay attention to these kind of ephemeral uh, little items, right? Uh, but in a Gans field case, you're basically in a perceptual desert and so it becomes much easier to attend to these phenomena. Um, so, if we can appeal to these cases, then what we would have is a situation where you're perceiving the darkened surroundings, you're perceiving along with them these phosphenes, and this is what functions as the perception in cases like uh, ocular being in a completely darkened room or being blind. Uh, in fact, you can appeal to a helpful combination of metaphors which come from uh, John Campbell uh, and uh, well, the other is cited by Fitch but uh, is, comes from this uh, psychologist in the 1950s or 60s called West. Um, and so the combination of metaphors is this. Uh, Campbell describes the relational view of perception or naive realism as involving something like a pane of glass where you look through this glass but the glass is highly volatile and needs to be uh, adjusted so or calibrated so that it fits the surroundings well uh, so that it can remain uh, transparent. Now here's the extension that Fitch uh, or West uh, proposes, now I'm quoting Fitch, uh, Fitch says West provides the analogy of a man looking out of a window from a room containing a fire. In bright sunlight, analogous to sensory input, the man sees only the world outside. However, as night begins to fall, the man begins to see things inside the room reflected on the glass. While the fire burns br brightly, which is analogous to cortical arousal, the man sees the contents of the room as if they were outside the window. But when the fire dies down, he sees nothing. Okay, so this brings us to the final two cases, the case four and case three. In case four, uh, so I'm going to start with case four. In case four, uh, what we should say is that ocular is in fact deluded and not hallucinating. And this is because if its whole visual system is removed, then it can't process anything visually and so can't hallucinate anything visually. I think we should compare case four to the case of a human who says, I'm suffering from echolocation hallucinations. More likely what we should say is that this person is deluded or has a mistaken belief about what they're undergoing rather than in fact going through echolocation hallucinations. And the reason we should think this is that they don't have anything to process echolocation with. And so if ocular's visual system is entirely removed, I think that it can't see, but it also can't hallucinate. Finally, this brings us to case, uh, type, uh, cases of type 3. And these cases of blindness are a little difficult because there can be so many different ways that one might go blind. 
Now, I think that these cases are going to either divide into cases uh, like uh, 1 and 2 or uh, cases like 4. If the damage is really pervasive, then uh, the visual system is going to be destroyed entirely and so uh, ocular is going to have an absence of perception and so not be able to hallucinate. By contrast, if uh, the damage is more superficial, then you might get situations where you're perceiving less and less until you're perceiving nothing, uh, but uh, those cases would be cases of perceptions of absence. So, uh, if there are any intermediary cases of type 3 that don't belong in either of these two categories, I think it's the burdens on the opponent to tell me what these cases are uh, for us uh, to deal with them. Okay, so this leaves chaos cases as chaos uh, as being just one more case on the smooth transition, but cases that involve internally generated stimuli. Now, you might think that there might be one more response, and this might be that you might think that the chaos case actually involves something more. It involves stipulating that the surroundings are inadequate for uh, the experience that the subject is going through. The problem with this is twofold. Uh, first, this is not clearly what we conceive when we conceive of the chaos case. And more importantly, uh, this seems to decide, if, if we stipulate this, it seems to decide an empirical matter a priori. It seems uh, an empirical matter whether we in fact uh, perceive, uh, uh, sorry, it seems like an empirical matter whether our brains are capable of uh, generating this kind of full-blown phenomenology without any contribution from the surroundings uh, or not. But if we stipulate this, then we decide this affirmatively, we decide that the brain can do this, and I think that uh, this would be a legitimate. Okay. Um. Um, all right, uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Alexandra, for uh, the interesting comments and for appreciating the thought that went into the view. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief response. Uh, for everybody else, you can also take a look at my Phil Studies paper, Does Hallucinating Involve Perceiving?, which would contain some more of the details, and hopefully there will be another paper coming uh, sometime in the near future. Um, okay, so I've lumped the six comments into uh, three uh, sets, right, which I'll talk about. So first of all, comments one and six uh, concerning the naming uh, and the marginality of the view. Um, so I've actually used many different names for to talk about these types of hallucinations. I've used the perceptual view of hallucinations, the illusionist view of hallucinations to emphasize the similarity to illusions, and hallucinatory perception. I think perceptual hallucination wouldn't be great because I think all uh, hallucinations are perceptual, so it would be kind of by definition true, but I'm not really sure. If anybody has any recommendations, I would be uh, super happy to hear them. Um, as for the marginality of the view, uh, that's right, so I think that uh, hallucinations are taken to be non-perceptual in the philosophy of perception in the sense that they don't involve perception, but I think they're taken to be perceptual in another sense, which is that they involve the sort of a sensory character that's distinctive of perception. Here what I'm arguing is that in fact hallucinations possess the sensory character because they do involve perception. Um, but yes, in general I agree that the view that hallucinations do involve perception needs to be taken more seriously in the philosophy of perception, especially given that the rest of the views aren't uh, uh, doing great, you know, in general. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, as for comments 2 and 5, these are concerning the constitution claim, uh, the smooth transition and the role of easy hallucination. So by similar constitution, I, I don't need to be saying anything, uh, well, I don't have a particular view on constitution. All I mean is to say is that they're both fundamental to, uh, uh, or, or perception is uh, constitutive, uh, right, in the sense that it's fundamental of perceptual experiences and necessary for these perceptual experiences. We might have a stronger constitution thesis by focusing on phenomenal character. I actually think this, but I'm not going to be defending it, uh, or I'm not defending it here. Um, so I also agree that the smooth transition isn't enough to ensure similarity of constitution. I think that we need to focus on cases themselves too. I think the smooth transition helps, but you do need cases like Ocular's case and some of these other cases that I discussed in the longer paper, uh, in the published longer paper. Um, okay. This also means, uh, concerning comment 5, that partial and easy cases uh, do contribute to the view. Indeed, it's important to uh, note that uh, most hallucinations are easy, and uh, this it seems wrong-headed to focus on the hard cases and try to explain the easy cases uh, using them. Uh, if the easy cases are the majority of cases, we should start by giving a characterization of them and try to export that characterization uh, to hard hallucinations. So this is also something that I argue in another paper that's still under review. Um, um, okay, uh, also I should note that a lot of times uh, these easy cases are lumped into illusions, but I think this is uh, incorrect. Um, as for comments 3 and 4, uh 
So, um, yeah, I, I thought these were uh, interesting. Um, let me see what I want to say. Um, uh, so, I'm skeptical that you can distinguish hallucinations solely in terms of how weird or not weird the object is. So, I actually prefer, but the, the view I prefer is that although I think that hallucinations involve perception, I think that's just the first component. So, they're partly perceptual and then you need to add whatever else uh, it is that would make them hallucinatory. So, you can call this like a two-layer view or a conjunctive view. It's a bit like an a view of illusions. In illusions, you have one part is that you perceive the object and then some additional conditions make it so that it's illusory. I'm, I'm kind of uh, partial and I've tried to defend, I'm uh, uh, also still under review, uh, uh, this claim that there's an additional component, the additional component is actually picture perception, this is what I think hallucinations in fact involve. Um, and uh, in fact this is important to do because uh, there's various hallucinatory properties that need explaining, uh, things like singular reference that Johnston talks about, uh, but also privacy as you note. Um, and there are other empirical observations that we could use, so for instance in Charles Bonnet syndrome, Fitch in uh, the paper that I discussed, right, uh, discusses, you know, these specialized visual uh, regions, right, uh, which seem to uh, be correlated, their activation seems to be correlated with seeing items of particular sorts. So I think that these phosphenes might be able to take shapes in of uh, particular sorts depending on uh, which of these uh, specialized visual regions are uh, activated. Um, okay, so I think these are just kind of a uh, five-minute quick response, uh, but if you have any more questions, please uh, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you.